Rural Board of Education meeting is now called to order. If you choose, please join us in a moment of prayer. Mr. President. Father, thank you so much for the beautiful sunshine that you gave us today. Father, what a gorgeous spring day. Father, thank you for each person that's here tonight to talk about the future of our children and our schools. Father, I just pray that uh, you give us wisdom and we make decisions. Father, and we'll allow everything that's done to be in the best interest of our students. Thank you so much for our teachers and our parents and all of our faculty. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You join us to pledge allegiance to our flag.
It is worth noting that the Spain Park girls also made it to the championship. Um, unfortunately, they fell out of the quarterfinals, but what an accomplishment for this one high school to make it to that level of play in the first season of play in this new sport. I'm going to hand over the podium to Ms. Barbara, who's going to recognize a couple of employees of Trace Crossings, and after her, Ms. Green is going to share an, um, information about a transportation employee with Mr. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Dodson. I would like to have Ms. Dana Joyner and Ms. Mandy Stone to come up, please. Ms. Joyner is the steam facilitator at Trace Crossings Elementary, and Ms. Stone is our assistant principal at Trace Crossings. Um, it's my pleasure to recognize these two people this evening. On their own, Ms. Stone and Ms. Joyner participated in an online course this past summer and through the fall and they are now STEAM, STEAM certified instructors. Uh, this was a 40 hour course through STEAM EDU. The focus of this professional development was to learn about the integration of science, technology, engineering, art, math, and science, uh, math, art and math, um, it, and the impact that it has on education. The focus for this professional development is why is this being done? How does it work? and how is it going to affect you, your school, and your community. And I'm so pleased to say this evening that as a result of the professional development efforts at Trace Crossings by Ms. Joyner and Ms. Stone, and through their efforts of support, hand-holding, cajoling perhaps a little bit, that that STEAM philosophy and the concepts have been thoroughly integrated and embedded in the philosophy of teaching and learning at our school. And that's a direct result of some of the efforts of Ms. Joyner and Ms. Stone. So we congratulate them on their STEAM certification.
make it my life a lot easier, my job a lot easier. Kathy Burnett, she's our route supervisor. Jim Moore, he's our shop owner. Last month, transportation employees gathered for the annual Love the Bus award ceremony that was hosted by the State of Alabama Department of Education along with transportation staff. During this time, bus drivers are recognized for exceptional service both on the job and off the job, with one driver being selected as the 2016 School Bus Driver of the Year. This year's winner is no exception. She demonstrates an unwavering love for her job and her children that she serves daily. And that love extends well past her last stop that afternoon. She goes above and beyond her calling to ensure that each student enjoys life to the fullest. Some things that was mentioned during her nomination, she's been known to host ice cream parties, pizza parties and skate parties, and even, even Easter egg hunts for her students on the bus. Will Rogers once said, never stop doing little things for others because sometimes those little things occupy the biggest part of our hearts. I'm sure this holds true for everyone's life she touches. It definitely has for mine. I've been honored to know this lady for about 16 years, and she can cook pretty good pork chops and drink. She has done that also. <laughs> but it's my pleasure to present the 2016 School Bus Driver of the Year for the State of Alabama, Ms. Rhonda Hope. Now we'll move on to our public participation piece. Any public participation? No public participation. We shall move on to our action items. We have the minutes before us uh, August, no, August 3rd, 8th, 2016. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Do I have a second? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Minutes have been passed. Next on the agenda, personnel report. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Do you have a second? Second. Any questions from the board? Does 
No questions from the board. All in favor say aye. <coughs> All opposed. Personnel report has been approved. Next on the agenda, business action items. Do I have a motion to approve our business action items? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions from the board? Questions from the board? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Action items have been approved. Next on the agenda, budget amendment. We have a motion to approve the budget amendment. Mm -hmm. I have a second. second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Next on the agenda, professional service agreement. We have a motion to approve. So moved. We have a second. Any questions from the board? If there are no questions, all in favor say aye. All opposed. Item has been approved. <coughs> Next on the agenda, City Hoover's purchase of right of way. Uh, may I get a motion for approval? So moved. Can I, can I get a second? Second. Any questions from the board? Mr. President, is anyone here from the city engineer or from the city over here right now? Um, it's my understanding, um, Ms. Antti and Dr. Murphy would like to speak on what this is. It's a, it's a narrow right away on the Road, generally on um, northeast to uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, yes, it's, we, we own out on I-95 on Valley Dale Road. On the opposite side of the street of the high school, we own State Park. Opposite side of State Park, we own the Narrows, we own uh, some little outcroppings of, of property there. And the city has come and asked us to provide an easement along the very edge of Valleydale Road to, to enable them to widen Valleydale Road. Um, they were willing to pay us for the, the less than an acre of land that it will take and also compensate us for use of an additional about 1.7 um, area, acre area they'll use for staging and equipment equipment purposes while they're while they're doing the road work on Valleydale Road. And we of course see any improvement to Valley 
Dale Road is something that's very beneficial to the school board and we're very pleased to see that, that this is happening and very pleased to see that we're, we are getting compensated for that, that parcel of land. So we think it's, we think it's a very, very fair and generous arrangement. Ms. Ante, is there any time frame on the temporary construction easement? I believe they're rather anxious to go ahead and get started on it. Um, I've gotten several calls about when are you when is your board going to approve this? And I said, good board meeting this week, so I will call them next week, and then they'll probably be able to give me a time frame once once they know that we've given them the right of way to begin. Any additional questions? Public? Any questions? Thank you. Say aye. Aye. All opposed. Why do we has been approved? Next on the agenda, obsolete items. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. I have a second. Second. Any questions from the board? No questions. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Item has been approved. Next on the agenda, agenda our verbal therapy contract amendment. Can I get a motion for approval? So I get a second. Second. Any questions from the board? Mayor, do you want? I'm motion to be moved. Anybody have any questions? Um, 
it's time for us to go ahead and repair these two roofs. And um, we believe that now, from a pricing time for the cost of the materials, that it's an advantageous time for us to go in and, and be able to get, the, get these two roofs repaired for what had originally been estimated for just one roof. So we think it's a very good time and piece for us as well, and something that very much needs to be done to our proposed two schools. So one quick question. Uh, in the past, this believe maybe five years ago compared to now, square area per dollar for this particular type of roof is comparable to what? How much are we spend now versus the uh we've been noticed uh sure. the state of the name was Again, this is this is not for the actual work. This is just to draw the contractual documents in which the roofing companies will bid on. Well, they'll and they'll be they'll be the project manager for the construction. They'll do all the oversight to it. They'll do the bid. They'll do the design. They'll do the they'll do the it kind of you know the, the whole soup to nuts type um, project to where that that way we're required to do that under under state law. We have to have engage an architect for any type of these services. Just say, oh, we know this roof, we know they can come in and do these roofs for us. We're not, we're not permitted to do that. Any public works project is required to have an architect necessity. And many times, uh, the State Department pre qualifies yes. uh, this type this of This is true. Yes, yes thank you. Thank you. This is a replacement or a replacement. Okay. Information we're reporting to the Department of Education. Okay. Okay. Information report. Uh, we'll start off with our legislative update, Mr. Kelly. Hopefully, most of you are reading in the newspaper following this crisis um, site. You understand that Senate Bill 316 is on the Senate floor. Unless Tricia no more than I do for the future day. Okay. Senate Bill 316 is introduced by Senator Lawrence from Aniston. Uh, it's called PREP. It's an acronym. It started out as the REISE bill. Nothing to do with raising teacher salary. Totally separate. And it is morphed into what is now. Notice the prep act. It is a bad, bad bill. There's only a couple of things in there, uh, really, from educator side, and what we can learn very quickly that's good for education. It would basically create a state-run board to come in and tell us how we do personnel actions. If we decide to terminate a certified teacher, we would have to get approval from the state board. It's got a value-added measurement system plugged into it. But they're going to create some test. And 25% of evaluation of teachers will come from this test. 75% is a, a five-tier scale. And they'll evaluate teachers. And it'll, it'll give them anywhere from basically a failing, as they call it, that. a failing all the way up to exemplary uh, rating. And somebody else is coming in from the state level, they're going to create a bureaucracy and come in and tell local districts how to run their business. Uh, and it's not just this district speaking against it. Mount Brook, Vestavia, uh, Pelham, Dr. Murphy, you can correct me. Uh, we have the state teacher here from Vestavia speak against it. Please, we have three senators in the district we're in, Senator Blackwell, Senator Ward, and Senator Black. It is in their hands right now. If you will. Yes. Okay, sorry. 
if you will please, it's just a simple email. You can go to the, uh, the sites, email them that you oppose, Senate Bill 316. And please trust us that, that this is not a good bill. Um, and we're, we're discussing this in public, so at one point we may come out in a statement with the board against this, which we can do now we've discussed it. And I'm certainly open if you need any information from me. You can get my email address. Uh, it's kellyboe at gmail.com, but you can find it on the school district site. You can go through there if you want. I'll give you communications on it, give you the updates on what's going on. And this, this is bad. Uh, so thanks for listening. That's what I'm doing. Thank you. And to add another senator, Roger Spittleman is also in our district as well, and covers uh, the Cyrus <coughs> area and also Ross Bridge. So we have, a, we have two different counties and also have a ton of representatives in Mm -hmm. Craig actually had an opportunity last week to speak about the prep bill and represent the Alabama Association of School Boards and did so eloquently. Uh, well, sorry that came out of the committee with a 5 4 vote, uh, but nevertheless appreciate him advocating on behalf of uh, our school district and at large that this is a very poor bill. I had asked Brian Phillips if he would share a piece of legislation that certainly is going to impact us also, if we could just take a minute. So I want to talk quickly about the WIRED Act. Uh, it's an amendment to the Alabama Head Act a few years ago. It passed Senate House, went to the governor, there was an amendment, and it's sitting in the basket at the Senate today. It could pump $50 million into the wired infrastructure for our schools. Uh, and for us, uh, we already have a great, uh, we would pass every step of what is there for the standards for our wireless, so for us, it would go to student devices or bills that we have outstanding there against it. Uh, I mean, for us, it could be as much as $400,000. Uh, so look at that. I have all the information as well. You can come, we'll talk through it. Uh, right now, it's sitting dead in the Senate because it went from the governor back to the Senate. So there's chance of a rewrite and some amendments there. Uh, but if you do get a chance, same thing. Speak to your legislators. Uh, dial Chastain, Poole, all of those guys are the guys that really put this together to begin with. Uh, and vote yes for that, to ask them to vote yes for that. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? No questions. Next we have on our annual report, benchmark and chief of data for reading and math, Dr. Dotson. Members, if I can indulge you, I'm going to try to get a little bit of data up here to show you.
this is a similar chart for math. It's a little bit easier to see. The one you were just looking at was reading, but you'll see that they both, uh, you see where the two lines connect in the upper green area in every one. The first column at each grade level is the test that we gave the students the first couple of weeks they were back in school. And so our students were starting out already ahead of the national average, which is good. And now at the mid-year point, uh, we check the students typically in January, uh, close that out in February. Um, closing out at the midpoint of the year, our students are ending up also in that high average area above the national average. Especially pleased to see that growth in terms of what we look for is, is that upward slope matching the upward slope that we see in the national population. And if you do some extrapolation there, you can kind of see that. Um, I've got other charts here, and I'll copy these for you that show how our um, at-risk populations do. And as we talked about last year, um, they typically start lower, but they're doing very, they're doing, um, their slopes are exactly the same. I'll pull up just a couple um, to show you what I mean by that. This, for example, is our special ed population. The main body of students is on the top. And of course, as you would expect, our special ed students are behind. But what's really pleasing to see is that over the course of this school year, those students are making the same progress as other students. The main thing is they're farther behind. And hopefully, um, we're accelerating them uh, to overcome the gaps that they're coming to school with. So I'm pleased with this day. I know we've had a lot of distractions the last few months, a lot of things going on. And I'm just proud of our teachers, I'm proud of our kids for hanging in there, doing what we need to get done every day, and I'm feeling very, very good about the results that we'll see at the end of the year. So I just want to share that good news with you. Board members, we'll give you uh, copies of this data so you can study that in more detail and answer any questions you might have. with us. Uh, these are our assistant principals who during our summer time together I said what do you need? How do we support you? And our assistant principal said please give us some academy, some mentoring, some opportunities from which we can grow and develop. These are all aspiring principals obviously as assistant principals they're looking forward to the next opportunities in their career climb, and I've asked them, first of all, I want them all to stand, those who are participating in our Aspiring Principals Academy. Um, and I don't want to steal their thunder, I've asked them to just briefly share with you what the Aspiring Principal Academy looks like. So, ladies, slide over to the mic, those who you who are sharing with us. And others, y'all coming up, join them. We'll let them be the spokesperson, but we want to see all your faces, so head over here with us. I'm very proud of this group. I, we were actually in Montgomery together a few weeks ago for our legislative session, so they're really getting the gamut of some really good opportunities, and I'm very proud. Bring a wealth of knowledge, information, and lead our learning. 
and they willingly agreed to come and join us and it sort of has evolved into what we call this Iron Principles Academy. Our group consists of elementary, middle, and high school assistant principals who are interested in growing professionally. We've learned a tremendous amount from Ruth and Pat, but also from each other. Uh, it's nice to have time to collaborate with other assistant principals, especially from different levels. Um, that doesn't happen very often, so we've learned a lot from our high school and middle school people as well, and they've learned a lot from elementary people. Um, one of the things we've done is we read a book, The Moral Imperative Realized by Michael Fullen, and uh, this is a great book. It's a short read. It's an easy read, um, but it has great uh, ideas. But the main thing is it's not only having a moral imperative, but actually putting it into action. So we want not only to raise the bar and close the gap of student achievement, we don't want to say that as a slogan, but see it as a reality. And so had lots of great uh, examples of schools and what they're doing, things that we can take and learn um, at, our, at our own schools. We've also been looking at five critical leadership practices, and they're reflected in actually Ruth and Pat that are leading us. Uh, just this book was published, just came out in January. Um, the five critical leadership practices, the secret to high performing schools, and those are focus on direction, build a powerful organization, ensure student focus, vision, and action, give life to data, and lead learning. So I think if we stick to those five, we'll be pretty strong leaders. Um, in addition, we've done lots of uh, look at schools, different case studies, and what they're doing to reflect those leadership practices. In February, as Dr. Murphy said, we had the opportunity to embark on the State House something that I don't believe any of us had ever done before, and it was definitely eye-opening and a really wonderful experience. Um, we watched our legislators at work while we sat in committee meetings, and we would pop in and out of different meetings and scared a few people off the elevators, I think, when you have these 12 ladies <laughs> running around the state house, not really exactly sure where we were going. Um, we're there to support Dr. Murphy as she spoke against House Bill 125 at a public hearing should be very proud of her and her efforts to give educators a voice um, at, at the State House. So we appreciate that from you. Okay. <laughs> Last week, uh, some of us had the opportunity to visit Pike Road School, which is a new school district outside of Montgomery in the city of Pike Road. Um, we all, there were six of us who were able to go, and we have another group who's planning to go later, but we all left that visit just amazed and intrigued by what we saw at that K-8 school. Um, it's just really fun to go in different schools and see what's going on, what can you take and try at your school. But that school's mission and vision, mission and vision are focused on creating a culture of intellectual curiosity where students take ownership of their learning and are inspired to think, innovate, and create. And I think that's probably what we all want our students to be. Um, they use a standards-based grading system rather than the traditional A to F. And students know what they need to learn, and they decide how they want to learn it. And they are to take total ownership in their learning. Um, they have opportunities for their students to develop leadership skills, and are encouraged to embrace problems and create solutions. So we're appreciative to Dr. Murphy um, for this learning opportunity and look forward to continuing to learn and grow together. Responsibilities, obligations, and the thrills of what we do is to watch other people take their careers to the next level and making sure that we're supporting and nurturing them. And I'm, I'm pleased with this group that's uh, uh, doing a terrific job in their own professional development. Well, I have to say to Dr. Murphy, thank you for your leadership and uh, our assistant principals and get them engaged and not just the best place, but also the best place of our school, so thank you so much for that. Thank you, ladies. Um, also, would like to ask Melody if she would come up. We've taken a look at our calendar. Um, I do want to share with you, board members, before Melody starts, that we do have a tentative moving schedule, and I'm going to pass this down to you. 
um, so that you can see that we've given thought to the rezoning and its impact on our school district in terms of a moving schedule. I am very comfortable to say to you that while it's very ambitious of us uh, to think that we can uh, make all of these moves in the time frame that we have currently under our calendar, I believe that we can. However, just because we can, is it a better option for us to revisit our calendar? So my charge to Ms. Green the latter part of last week was pull the committee back together. Let's have representation from all of our schools so that all of our schools have a voice at the table. And let's talk again about how comfortable our constituents are as it relates to the calendar that we ask you to approve. I believe that was in January. With the new wrinkle, the new wrinkle being rezoning, we thought it was wise to come back and give some consideration and thought to that calendar. Again, while I'm very comfortable with that calendar, it is a very ambitious calendar to be able to start school in early August. So with that being said, I want to pitch it over to Melody. She did bring the committee together. I, I would say this, board members, as we move forward with calendars, there are a couple of uh, um, there are a couple of things that I think is, are, are imperative as we move forward with calendars. One is to make sure that every school is represented at the table when we're crafting the calendar. And uh, so for those principals who are out there, I think it's important that everyone have a voice at that table with representation so that you can bring back to us any conversations you might have as it relates to calendars. We certainly want our HPTC and other organizations represented, our parents represented. But uh, that's something that I want us to do. Look at how our committee is, um, uh, who's on our committee and who should be on our committee. And so that's, that's the other thing. Then I think one thing that's important as we look at calendars going forward is meeting a mutual or having a mutual agreement about what's the start date. So can we determine the start date and then develop that calendar out from that? Uh, I don't ever want it to be, here's calendar A, here's calendar B. I know you don't like either one, but vote for the one that you can live with the best. That's not a good strategy. And so I do want us to, to just give uh, some additional thought to how we uh, develop and design our school calendars. But again, with all that being said, Melody, would you just share with us from your work last week with the committee that came together with you? Certainly. Uh, we met in what we call expanded committee. We met an expanded committee. Every school was represented either by a parent or an administrator from that school. Uh, we also had representation from central office and then um, spoke with other administrators and other committee members who could not be present afterward. So the main concern that we were charged with was if it would be feasible, advantageous, or in any manner positive to reconsider the start date based on uh, rezoning plans. And again, we, we believe our rezoning transition plan is sound and it, it's doable. Uh, it is ambitious, but we do believe it's doable. But because of some of the feedback we have received, we thought, let's look at it and see. The committee um, did a great job. They uh, looked at the days that we had, the criteria that we had. One of the things I think is important to remember when we first formed the committee is that we were charged with keeping the semesters as balanced as possible because 8th grade through 12th grade take exams uh, and those credits are very important so it's important for that material to be as evenly divided as possible. And so with that and the 180 days uh, of instruction that we uh, are required to complete, you know, that's what made the start date so early because our committee spoke very strongly uh, in response to our community that Thanksgiving week needed to be a full week, that we needed the time in Christmas, and we also need a parent conference day. So when you look at the calendar that was approved, it's about as tight as you can get and keep that balance. When we came back and expanded the committee, we said, okay, if we, if we bought a week, so to speak, where would those five days come from in our calendar? And uh, we looked at multiple scenarios uh, and came up with basically stealing days from throughout the calendar, five of them. We juggled a little bit here, juggled a little bit there, moved the start date back after winter break, and uh, then extended uh, the end week, the last week, by two instructional days, so that teachers will actually have to come back after Memorial Day to sign off 
and to do their closing school activities, and students will go a full week afterward. But we managed to come up with five additional instructional days. Uh, part of that was because a curriculum graciously allowed us to split their district required days uh, and to flex some of these things out. But the calendar that we came up with is a possibility for amending actually begins school uh, on August the 11th for students on Thursday. It's a full week late start day um, and keeps the Thanksgiving holiday for students, keeps the things the same. But in January, they'll come back on the 3rd instead of the 4th and we will lose uh, one day in February that moves for PD day and then we will lose one of our possible inclement weather days. Overall, it sounds really good, but it does it does make the two semesters unbalanced significantly by 12 days. Not the best case scenario, but uh, might serve our purpose at this point. Forward questions? Are we prepared to put this out uh, following the meeting to a public uh, reasoning why the uh, change is made? I think so. And one thing I want you to realize is, uh, and I just brought samples. When we put out the surveys for the original two calendars, one thing that we heard consistently is, boy, we don't want to start that early, we don't want to start that early. But again, the mandate to balance those semesters is pretty strong when you're talking about what's good for students instructionally. I just brought you just a little quick, everything in yellow is a request for a late start day. So we felt like that the community has spoken on if possible we want a later start date. We didn't see it was possible in, in balance the semesters. Um, the faculty, just as a representation, because all the pages look about the same, was not nearly so strong a mandate. They were more concerned about starting later uh, in the week and some of the more instructional aspects. But our community, page after page, their one thing was, could we start later, could we start later? So we certainly can put it out for comment, but no. I think they spoke it. No, not more so for comment, just so they'll know the actual calendar. Now, we're, we're going to schedule the vote on this next one, is that correct? That, that's the pleasure of the board. Okay. And the only thing that, again, that I, I just want to reiterate to you from an educator perspective and from an instructional perspective is that you have um, 84 days in this amended calendar in the first semester and 96 days the second semester you have a 12-day difference between the content first semester to second semester and you can see a comparison chart that you have right. and so you do have that chart that allows you to take a look at that so board members your pleasure now we just simply wanted to come back together with the committee to say what would this look like if we gave more time as it relates to the possibility of rezoning our school district and uh, the timing that might take a little of that pressure off of us. But again, I clearly say to you I'm comfortable with the uh, plan that we've laid out for moving, but if it is the pleasure of the board and, and the, the stakeholders who came to the table for this revision of the calendar, then I certainly have no concerns. I would be remiss if I did not say that um, every member of the expanded calendar committee uh, wrote that they recommend this amendment regardless of the feasibility or practicality of the rezoning plan. They felt like that that was something that they wanted to recommend, and that was certainly the pleasure of that committee. Yeah, and, and the amendment is for us start date August 11th. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Uh, so, the question I'll have, and I'll ask my board do they have any questions. Can this come up for a vote today, or do we have to wait, Mr. Sweeney, to April to? I think you've got the discretion to decide what you want to do. Okay. So this time I'll ask the board to join in the comments. Okay. There's no comments. Uh, feel free to motion. <laughs> Move for us to accept the amended proposal that has been used to us with the later start date. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Any questions from the board? Any from the public? Any from the public? Um, Mr. 
Oh. This is acceptable to the State Department, I suppose, to have the 84 days. Um, yes, they, are, they do not dictate that, though, generally speaking, you want your semester to be closer aligned than a 12-day difference, but this would not be something that would be rejected at the state level. Ron, what are your thoughts? Yeah. And the question was, was this uh, okay with the state department? The question was, what was the last day of school on the amendment proposal? The last day on the amendment proposal is Friday, May the 26th. For your students? For students. Previously, it was May the 24th, so it's a two-day addition for students at the end. It does bring our teachers back one additional day after the memorial holiday, which is sometimes the preference of teachers to be finished in front of the holiday, but it does bring us back for one additional teacher day beyond that. And we have done that before. Wouldn't be a best case scenario, but we've done it before. Okay. Any additional questions from the public or the board? Are there like e-learning days in there that could account to help count? For that, no, that in our district, e-learning is an everyday experience. Well, I understand so that. I'm just that's, trying to yeah. add those days at the first of the semester, as well as me as a parent. I'm not opposed to the three days of Thanksgiving. But I think when my kids come back after that, they're toast. They're, they're <laughs> done right after Thanksgiving, to be quite honest. That kind of, they lose their, they come back for high school <coughs> just a week, week and a half, and then they've got finals. So. Well, in, in our original committee meetings, um, when we looked at all the survey data, and there were over 850, like 872 parent responses, and it was overwhelming, you know, a 10 to 1 to keep Thanksgiving week. So that's why we just kind of took that one off the table. So, but I do know that many of our district, sister districts, meet part of Thanksgiving. Yeah. Any additional questions or comments from the public? If no additional comments, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed. The proposed calendar has been approved, but just one more quick comment. We will be sending out a small summary of why. Yes. Okay. Melody, Jason. That will go out first thing in the morning. Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board members, I want to share with you uh, two real estate options that have presented themselves to us as a board. Uh, one, I have had conversations with Dr. Sheila Phillips, who's the superintendent, Vestavia Board of Education, and Vestavia has expressed an interest in purchasing Old Berry High School. Uh, Dr. Phillips and, and I have recently walked through the building and the campus. She has expressed uh, interest and desire to continue a conversation with us regarding that. At this particular time, I have no recommendation for you or no action to request of you. I simply want to inform you publicly as to those conversations with Dr. Phillips in the interest of Vestavia Board of Education and also because I wish to desire to be very transparent with our public regarding the interest of Vestavia and the conversations that we are having. The uh, second real estate option that has presented itself to us came to us from U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel has approached me with an option for Hoover City Schools to purchase the Hidden Valley property, which is off of I-459. The total acreage of that is 136 acres. I will tell you uh, that the topography of that property has a number of challenges. The grade of the land, uh, streams, wetlands, uh, location of some old coal mines, so there's a lot of due diligence that's going to need to be done in terms of looking at that property. Um, however, the question is, would that property or some other property serve us well in the future as we think about potential growth and a potential site for uh, an additional school? Again, at this time, I have no recommendations or no request for you to take any action. Again, I share this information to keep you fully informed of a conversation that I've been having with U.S. Steel. So the purpose is to inform you uh, publicly of those two property options to be extremely transparent with our community. Uh, and also to ensure that as your superintendent, 
you know and you're satisfied with the conversations that I'm having and the, and the directions that I'm taking on behalf of the school district. Obviously, a great deal of study needs to continue as we look at uh, our school uh, potential for growth, and uh, um, we certainly just want to keep you advised of those options that are out there available to our board. If you have any questions or concerns, I'd be glad to try to talk about that. Dr. Murphy, thank you uh, for the update. Um, we all realize this is a, a moving target, but it's something we always have to be looking for. Um, as, as far as long as our city continues to grow, uh, we have to be able to grow with it. Uh, and uh, I'm excited that uh, you are pursuing uh, as many options as we can find for us, and I uh, encourage you to, to keep working hard for all of our students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got a quick question. Any any offers? Any money been discussed? Any offers well, or any me, money? Uh, any anything you can share with us? Let me, let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Any just requests for the board for fun? Any offers? Uh, any money amounts? Anything you can share with us on those two? Um, I have years? no offer from Vestavia in terms of an amount of money at this time, but an expressed interest from Dr. Phillips on behalf of Vestavia. I would anticipate that Vestavia may be coming forth fairly immediately with an offer in hand. Uh, at that time, we'll continue our conversations. As it relates to the property at Hidden Valley, there's been a, an amount of money, money that's been bantered around, but I would say that's not definitive at this point, and we'd rather not discuss it since it's not a definite amount at this time. Thank you. Did, did uh, Vestavia indicate how they might use the property? The question was, uh, did Vestavia indicate how they may use the property? It, it's certainly my understanding, though, I'm not sure that we really got into a lot of detail about their interest in terms of the use of it, but it's, it's my understanding they want to use it as a school for, for the purpose of, of education. Um, Any additional questions from the public? That's correct. Years ago, when developers used to build these large housing sections in our school, in our city, they used to donate property for a school. And I was just wondering if anybody would be willing to look into the idea if maybe U.S. Steel owed us some property from some free rides they got somewhere along the way. Um, Y'all can phrase it however you want, but I, I just, I, you know, we, we never used to pay for property. Schools and somewhere along the way, Mr. Craig began to pay for property for schools. And I'm just wondering, and maybe that needs to be revisited. That is not a common practice. So I would encourage you to maybe look at the history and make that part of the negotiations. Perhaps. I know that sometimes uh, plots of land are set aside for school districts and subdivisions. The problem sometimes becomes the size of what's set aside. Uh, as an absolute minimum, you need 30 to 40 acres for an elementary school and something significantly larger than for that for a full-blown high school with uh, athletic venues. Uh, so uh, I, certainly that's something that we are aware of, that, that sometimes pots are set aside for such purposes. Um, and we'll continue those conversations with all our builders and developers. We're, we're, we're happy to be the recipient. The size has to be large enough to facilitate a, a school. And just to look at some numbers, uh, the city of Hoover in 2000 up until now has grown from 62,000 to roughly 84,000. Now, according to the trends <coughs> that are coming out, uh, by 2026, we are gaining another 10,000 uh, people here take us up to roughly 95,000 folks. So the sixth largest city uh, in the state, uh, back in customers. I am having ongoing conversations with uh, builders and developers who are becoming, who are very transparent as it relates to their plans uh, and the growth, uh, both in terms of single family and anything on the books as far as uh, multifamily. So, Lots of good conversations are taking place between the school district and builders and developers. I've had builders and developers for the last two weeks who've been in my office sharing uh, 
the direction that their companies are taking. And I uh, would also share with our public that we've had conversation with our city. So our, our, our city has full disclosure as to these two options that's come to our attention because the collaborative working relationship is what we all expect and it's what we all desire and it's what we all want. Thank you. Mr. Murphy, I, I hope everybody heard what was just said by, by our superintendent. Uh, in the past two weeks, she has had conversations with all of the major developers, home builders in our city. There's been conversation with our city officials all about the future of our school system. That is extremely encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, whereabouts is that uh, U.S. Steel property? It is the uh, property um, that is uh, basically cornered at 150 and 459. It's 136 acres. It's adjacent to the Glass and the Whitaker lands, if you know where that is. I don't. It, 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 that's it. The, the, the property actually uh, joins the Zerg Parkway right at 459. Um, if you're going north on the Zerg Parkway, Target is on your left. Um, you'll go past First Commercial Bank. Um, and right before you go under 459, the property is there and runs east parallel with the uh, interstate. Uh, almost the glass of Whitaker property actually always takes it all the way back to um, Pat Creek. That, that, that should be the uh, same piece of property that uh, Hoover has, uh, City of Hoover officials have uh, tried to change the zoning. So that's part of the 273 Yes, the 273 is the Hidden Valley, the glass, and the Whitaker property. It's that whole strip. But the piece for which we are having conversations is the U.S. Steel property plus or minus 136 acres. Okay, the question was, the well, discussion of the silver variable, what will happen to new beginnings and the crossroads program? Um, there, there is several possibilities. One might be bringing those students back onto our high school campuses for an after school or night school so that we're uh, fully utilizing our campuses, which I believe our high schools already almost run around the clock, if I'm not mistaken. but those students could be pulled back onto our campuses after school. Um, I do know that uh, some of our students do edgenuity, and we have Anna Whitney who's up top, um, that a number of those students learn via uh, edgenuity, which is a computer software program, so that we would uh, possibly bring those programs back to those schools and use facilitators to support that instruction. And, um, you know, those are things that I want to continue to think about and talk about. And and uh, with all due respect to Anna, she and I have not had opportunity to talk about. So I feel a little odd to be having this conversation and almost to need to look at you, Anna, and say, sorry about that. But um, I do want to continue to have conversations. Uh, I have had some conversations with our two high school principals. I hope they don't mind me referring to them. We talked a little bit about what that might look like. But very preliminary at this point, one thing we do know is that whatever we do with our students who are in our Crossroads programs, uh, Second Chance, the Department of Just Justice has a vested interest in what that looks like. And so I have already been transparent with the Department of Justice and the Legal Defense Fund to say to them an opportunity has come our way. We're looking at it. We're talking about it. We don't know exactly where we are with this. Uh, because we're in some very preliminary stages with some conversations and uh, and uh, at least from those conversations there was no huge, there was no pushback or resistance that they know that we're going to find best case scenarios for those students and uh, so this is not something that those two parties are unaware of. We have had some conversation with them. Virtually. And if, uh, how many kids, how many high school kids right now are, are fully online? Do we have any that are fully 9th through 12th grade online? We don't have any that are 100% online. Okay. 
Um, we had a, about 150 students express interest in that for next year. Um, there's a meeting tomorrow night with um, those parents and students who have been invited to. So we'll begin to whittle that down and see what that's going to look like once we get through. But right now, about 150 uh, responded to a survey that they were interested in learning more about it. One of the things that we know, Trish, is that as we may have more students who are interested in virtual learning, that may help us relieve a little bit of the overcrowding that, um, that we expect or perhaps are having, particularly at Hoover High School. One, just one pitch, and that is that the national research is not showing fantastic results with kids who are 100% online, so please be careful with that. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the research substantiates a more blended learning approach. However, the state has allowed us now to go to virtual schools, and I'm surprised that a number of schools expect that all the way down to the early middle school years, where students can go 100% virtually from the middle school level. I was just learning of one such school district here in Alabama a few days ago, so that's a little frightening to me. But um, I do hear your concern. Some of our students learn best with technology. Others find that very challenging, but a lot of the research does support more of a blended approach to instruction. Any additional questions from the public or board? I do want to apologize to Anna. Anna, you and I do need to have some conversations. Uh, and has been trying to get into my busy schedule, and so we'll make that happen. And nothing's a done deal. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of conversations yet to be had, and certainly those with Anna are most appropriate, Anna. Okay, thank you. Now, we, uh, our next scheduled board meeting is April 18th at 5.30 at Green Valley Elementary School. Again, April 18th at 5.30, Green Valley Elementary School. Uh, now, The board has determined that a executive session meeting is needed. Uh, Chris Sweeney has supplied us with a certificate of compliance. <coughs> Do I have a motion to convene to executive session? So much. Do I have a se second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, we will stay in executive session roughly 25 minutes. Personal motion. No vote. 